Greetings, Hope students. This will be our last official online video lesson for the school year. Next week, we'll say hello to Michael, who will be teaching us for a summer series. Michael Knight, as you know, is our summer internship. Hey, before we get into the lesson, though, I just want to catch you up on what is student ministry going to look like this summer. There's a lot of questions about this right now, and here's some things I want you to be aware of. One, we don't know. Uh, it's just that simple right now, but we are making contingency plans for all sorts of stuff. We've had to cancel our summer trips, as you know. Uh, that's a little bit of a disappointment, but we are still going to celebrate community, the Word of God, the relationships we have with each other. We're just not 100% sure what that format would look like. We may still continue doing our online small groups, but we might not do them on Sunday nights. And we may get the ability soon to gather in groups of 10 or less where we might have to kind of subdivide our small groups. And we might be meeting in people's homes or doing things like that. What you need to understand is that no matter what stage we're in, we are going to try to maximize a couple of things, the relationship we have with God and the relationship we have with each other. That is going to be a priority, just like we talked about during last week's lesson. So we're talking about ways for Michael to support the community, but here's the thing. One-on-one -on -one discipleship and one-on-one -on -one counseling and one-on-one -on -one just fun communication is available with me and Michael in different capacities. So if you need a phone call, if you want to chat on Zoom, if you want somebody to come by your front porch and visit with you, you got things on your mind, we realize that this has been a very interesting season. We haven't had access to the same emotional support systems that we're used to, and we want to facilitate those as clearly as possible. So please contact me if you have any needs. Otherwise, we're going to go into the summer with a little bit of flex. As soon as we're able to gather together, we're going to figure out a safe, executable way for us to do that, uh, and that might look different. We also may have some small groups meeting on Tuesday night, some on Thursday night. kind of depends on some things. Um, we might be still doing the lesson digitally, but meeting in person, and we will hopefully, before this summer is over, gain the ability for all of us to get together in this place worship together, fellowship together, have fun, uh, but don't hesitate to ask questions, and we will try to keep you as up-to-date as possible. Now, let's dig into the Word. We're going to skip all the way to the end of Matthew. This will be the close of Matthew. Now, we were in Matthew 22 last week, which means we're skipping quite a bit of material. I expect that you have the ability to read that. There's a lot of good stuff happening at the end of Matthew, and, and things that we have known and celebrated, things common to the Christian faith, and uh, I, I want you to take a look at that. But today, I wanted to make room for Michael's lessons to begin this summer by culminating the book of Matthew the way that Scripture itself does, by ending in chapter 28 at the end of what we call the Great Commission. The Great Commission uh, is when Jesus has his disciples gathered, and he says this to them. In verse 18, Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you to the end of the age. What's going on here? Why do we call this the Great Commission, and, and, and what's happening? But it all centers around one thing. One thing is very, very clear. In order to fulfill the Great Commission, which is called a commission, because Jesus is giving them a mission. He is commissioning them to go, I am leaving, but here's your job. Here's your job. And, and, and we need to understand that as Christians, we have been given a job to do on this planet. And that's to represent him, but in a specific way. And so it falls around this term disciple. What is a disciple? If we're going to go, therefore, and make disciples, if this is the commission to go and make disciples, what does that mean? Right? So, so first, let's ask this question. What is a disciple? Well, if you look at like the Webster definition of what a disciple is, it says one who accepts and assists in spreading the doctrines of another, as in one of the twelve of the inner circle of Christ followers according to the gospel accounts. But another definition is simply a convinced adherent of a school or individual. In other words, it's somebody who has bought into the teachings of another. And what does it mean to buy into, and what does that do? Well, when it comes to Christ, Christ is taught that he was the Son of God, come to save the world. And so if you believe that, if you believe that, if you're a disciple of his, then you have a job. Now, there are those who would say there's a difference between just being a Christian and being a disciple, that somehow like that's another level of Christianity. Like we can come to faith in Jesus, but we're not all living the life of a disciple. But I would say that scripture doesn't leave any room 
to be a genuine believer of Christ and not be a disciple. Because if you believe in him, it means you accept it as truth. And if you accept it as truth, that he is the son of God and the only way that we have is heaven, then, then that is a truth worth devoting our life to. And Jesus speaks this way. So when he's speaking to those whom he has made into disciples, and he says, go therefore and make disciples, I don't think he's just speaking to these 12. I think he's speaking to every person who would become a disciple through their teachings. And you can see that even in John, in Jesus' prayer, he says, I do not pray just for them, but for those who will come to believe through their teaching. Jesus has always seen the multiplication effect of getting to know him. And that those who get to know him will introduce him to others. And this spread of the gospel, this making of disciples, is a big deal. So what does it mean? Well, if you want to get to it, before he actually says, go therefore and make disciples, he makes a very important statement. He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Why is this important? It's because we need to realize that we have someone we're reporting to as we make disciples. If we're going to teach the truth about Jesus Christ, we need to make sure that we're responsible to him. This isn't a Jesus that we've made up. This isn't Jesus how I'd like to imagine him. This is Jesus as he has revealed himself. He talks about his authority first. As a disciple, we do not generate our own ideas about God. We source them from Jesus himself. He is our final authority. Now, why is this important in making disciples? Because we live in a world that would like to say truth can be whatever I want it to be. I'll determine my truth. You determine your truth. I believe this part of scripture, not this part. And yet, Jesus is leaving room to go like, hey, this is what I have said. The buck stops with me. Do we take that into perspective as we consider what it means to be a disciple and even to make disciples? What does that mean? He's the authority. Now, this can fight two natural tendencies that people have, right? Like, um, I, I, I want you to see some things that, um, that are true from Scripture. One, uh, people tend to follow people. So when it comes to letting Jesus be our authority... The Son of God, sitting at the right hand of the Father in heaven now, not physically embodied in front of us, it, it could become difficult to go like, how do I even follow him when he's not here with me? Well, the Holy Spirit plays a large part in that. But despite that, as human beings, even Christians, throughout history, we've had this tendency to type, like make people our primary focus. Even look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11. It says, my brothers... Some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another says, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? This is Paul writing the letter. He's going, look, you don't follow me. You don't follow another teacher. And I would say this. You don't, you don't follow Greg or Mickey or your pastors here or some online famous pastor. That, that's one of the advantages of... Christianity today is we have access to all sorts of great teaching through YouTube and other formats, but we don't just pick, oh, I like this guy. I'm going to follow him, right? Like, that's not the way Jesus designed this. These people aren't our authorities. He is. He is the head. Do we just allow other teachers to digest what we believe about Jesus, or do we have a relationship with him through his word? Are we getting to know the way he has revealed himself? Which leads us to the other tendency we have to fight if he's the authority. One, I said, was that we have a tendency to follow other people. But the other is that we tend to want to make God fit into our idea of what he should be like instead of what he is. We try to go, uh, if I were going to imagine what a loving God was, this is how I think he would be. But remember, we're sinful people. Scripture tells us our heart is wickedly deceitful. We would fashion God into being whatever makes us comfortable and sometimes love doesn't look like comfort, but challenging us that there is a better way than that which makes us comfortable. And so we have to be careful not to follow people and also not to make up our own ideas of God. He is the authority, and he sets that as a very clear thing before he gets into the Great Commission. But then it gets into, if we accept that. The next statement is pretty big. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. 
those who he's made disciples, he's saying, look, go into the world. Tell them who I am. And he gives some boundaries to it. He says, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Now, what's significant about this? Well, one, I want you to see that, that he wasn't saying, hey, go and make disciples and figure out what works best for you. Figure out what kind of methods you want to use, what you think are the best way to string together a series of lessons to turn people into disciples. No, he's saying, um, he says, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He says it's important that we recognize our identity with Christ, being baptized into the church and, and proclaiming what we believe in him, but, but teaching them all that I have taught you. This isn't just teaching the messages Jesus taught them, but, but I believe it actually implies that the methods Jesus employed were important too. Teaching them in the way that I taught you. And if we look at what, what, what they would have understood as going, hey, you are a disciple. Look at what I did with you. And go into the world and do that with others. That's going to come very important. Do we see ourselves as disciple makers? Or do we think of it as something that only special few with special gifts are commissioned to do? Each person of these 12 had different gifts. You look at the different personalities as you read through the gospel. You look at Peter versus John and the way that these conversations, when you look at their backgrounds, how you had tax collectors, some from more of a religious background, and you look at the differences, and it's clear that Jesus is using people from all walks of life. It doesn't mean, hey, well, you can be a disciple maker once you've gone to seminary or gotten this education or been in Sunday school for six years. Or There's no like set thing here except that teach them what I taught you. And, and that's essentially what we've been studying all year. The book of Matthew was watching him walk with his disciples and the relationships he built with them. He would go and he'd say, hey, I'm going to teach. Listen to this. And then he'd go and go, hey, I want you to do this. Let me watch you and then come back. And I want to chew on that with you and say, did you find anything interesting when you did that? And why do you think that was? And he would ask questions and he would probe. It was a relational format. So disciple making isn't something where, hey, if you just go through these lessons, you're a disciple. It's learning to live life with people who celebrate Jesus, Intr being willing to introduce him to anybody you meet along the path and say, this is a way of life. It's not, hey, I do this, but on Tuesdays, I'm a disciple maker. This is a way of life. Jesus has been living life with them, and that's what made them disciples. And they would have understood, hey, what I did with you, go do with others. So my question is, is the pattern of your life leave room for you to make disciples? Or do you think it's an event? This can be a little scary, to be honest. We might not think of ourselves as disciple makers, or we might think it's a hefty responsibility, or we may say, sometimes I don't even know what I believe, so how am I supposed to do this with others? And this is where the context of relationship is important. We're not asking you to be the expert and stand up in front of a class and teach us all. We're asking you to get real about life with other people who are willing to be real about life. And in that setting, it's okay to go, hey, man, I've been raised in church, and I love Jesus, but i be honest, there are parts of Scripture that still confuse me. And there are parts that I struggle to believe, and I get confused when the world's telling me one thing and Scripture's saying this thing, and, and, and it's just being willing to enter into a relationship. You see, Jesus' disciples did the same thing. There were moments they were like, uh, Jesus, I don't understand that. Can you explain this? We find that confusing. Jesus wasn't afraid of their questions, and he's not afraid of yours. See, sometimes in church, we can feel like the game is like to pretend who loves Jesus best and endure to do that. We act like we know more than we do. We're okay. All of the disciples saw things like Peter walking out on the water and then getting scared and sinking down. All of the disciples were there when they like, were confused and going, Jesus, um, we can't feed this crowd. How are you going to pull that off? And then they got amazed when he showed that he was more capable than they realized. We don't have to pretend anything. And that's the importance of this disciple-making way of life. But guys, it happens in relationship. Once we realize Jesus is the head, once we realize he's been given all authority, once we realize it's him we're responsible to, and he's called us into relationship, and then he's asked us to go build relationships with others in the same way he did with these original 12, and that through that, the world's going to get to know him, 
we can begin to say, okay, I'm ready to set my life up to be a disciple maker. I am a disciple, but what we have to realize is there's no such thing according to Scripture as being a disciple who doesn't make disciples. So the question is, is how much of yourself are you giving to that task? Have you realized it's a way of life? Even today, is that something that you're kind of breaking through in a different manner? Look at what he says last. After saying, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. See, the one with all authority is with us. This isn't just us and our own strength. He wanted to encourage them that through the sending of his Spirit, he was going to be present with his children. So you don't just have to go like kind of read the textbook and then march out on your own and hope you get it right. You have one who walks with you. He is going to be in relationship with you as you develop relationships with others. Guys, this is one of the core things that we need to understand as his people. A call into relationship with others to proclaim how wonderful he is through our way of life, not just events, and the reliance that we have on him in the process. This is so important that this summer as a church, as a whole church, we're actually going to do a series this summer about relational disciple making. About what it means to develop relationships that matter within the body of Christ and how we develop a lifestyle that embraces our call to be a disciple maker and not just say, well, that's for the people who work at the church or that's with people's special gifting. Jesus is telling all of his disciples to go make disciples. And if when he meant is go do with others what I did with you, then there's going to be a domino effect that the ones who come to faith, they're going to do the same. They're going to go do with others. So that is a passed down call that results in our God being glorified, his name being made great, and more people coming to know his love. That's what I want for each of you, the people in your life, and I'm excited. This has been the book of Matthew. There's been a lot that we've seen about Jesus' love and relationship with us. Let's go build that same relationship with his other children. Let's get excited when we see people get adopted into the family for the first time because we're living the life of a disciple maker. Guys, I hope you have a great week. Summer's right around the corner. Get take a break from this e-schooling. Let's look forward to the day we can gather, even if it's in smaller circles. I'm looking forward to the summer ahead and what Michael's going to teach us next week. Thanks.